I don't know where else to start, but to start in the incredibly hard, to start in the impossible, because we can't have a conversation today without talking about the incredibly hard. I really believed it would be different. I really did. And you know, there are atrocities that are going on at any given moment, at any point all over the world. And of course, our eyes right now, our hearts, our eyes are on this war between, between Israel and Hamas, partly because as the United States, we're, our government's very involved in this. We're not not a part of it, even though we're so far away from it. And I, I thought it would be different because I always thought when I was younger in college and we were learning about you know, various atrocities that happened in the 90s where the United States had this position to be very involved and to make a difference and to, and to call for a, a stop, to call for a ceasefire, that maybe it didn't happen because not enough people knew about it because there wasn't all the social media. We weren't seeing the pictures and hearing the stories. We didn't have the information. There wasn't the outcry and maybe with social media, surely it would be different. And here we are in the midst of this horrible conflict. I can only imagine how afraid the Israeli families are, the families of those 200 people who are hostages right now. I can only imagine how afraid the people in Gaza are the one million people in the north who can't reasonably get to the south who are being killed on the daily. There have been over 10,000 people killed in Gaza in the recent weeks, 4,000 plus of them children. And all of the non-government organizations, all of the humanitarian non-government organizations in the world are calling for a humanitarian ceasefire. Every single one. It, the Church World Service, the Doctors Without Borders, the United Nations, both the denominations that our church is a part of. I, I can't find one that's not calling for it. And, and we can see it. We have the pictures. We have the videos. We have the stories of people who are suffering. I thought it would be different and I have been so quickly dispelled of that notion. And there are ripples too, ripples of that that are so much closer to home. Of course, the Holocaust was not that long ago. The anti-Semitism that bred the ground for that kind of atrocity against Jewish people is alive and well in this world. And people are using things like this as breeding ground for hate. For, for Jewish people, anti-Semitism is on the rise. Hate crimes against Jewish people are on the rise. They're at a high in the world. And hate crimes and Islamophobia are at a high in the world too. It's not just people who are 2,000 or who are thousands of miles away who are suffering. I know that I have friends who I am in the drop-off line with school who are afraid because of their identity marking them as a target. The people we run into in the pharmacy, the people that we see on the people we love are very afraid. And then we have the Beatitudes. We have Jesus coming in to a people who are oppressed, to a people who are experiencing occupation and proclaiming blessing for all of these people. The first couple of the blessings, you know, the, the uh, poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, they're, all, they're very much internal, they're of the heart. The ways you are empty, God will make you full. And then the last couple are very much external, opened up to the world, the way people who might advocate for justice and, and face the hardship with their hearts wide open, those blessed people too. And all of these blessings, they're not a checklist. Though certainly we might see ways that we want to aspire to live differently and live into these blessings. They are blessings spoken to people for right now. You are blessed, you are blessed. Blessed are you. It is about the here, the right now, in the midst of this very broken world. And it's Jesus doing what Jesus does, where he takes the world as we know it. The ideas of 
success, the ideas of what we're supposed to achieve in terms of finances, in terms of power, in terms of, of what we're supposed to know all of the things and be confident in all of the things, and he turns it upside down and instead blesses all of the people who don't know what to think, blesses the people who are the powerless, blesses the people who are at the bottom of the societal expectations of what is supposed to be. It is a total upending of everything we know taking the world and turning it upside down, teaching us something that is totally counterintuitive. Patrick was 17 years old and in his home country of Ireland and deciding that he didn't really know what to do next. So he found this missionary organization. He thought, maybe I can go help some people. Maybe I can travel and learn about the world. And so he got out the form to fill it in. And as he was filling in the form, there were these four check boxes. And the, the form said, check any of these boxes that apply to you. The first one was alcoholism. The second one was the occult. The third one was drug addiction. And the fourth one was homosexuality. And it was that very moment that Patrick uh, came out to himself and on this paper. He checked the box of homosexuality. And after he checked that box, admitting not just to himself that he was gay, but also to this organization, he started to feel this huge sense of impending, I am an abomination. And the Irish word for abomination comes from the word monster. I am a monster. And that was what was playing over and over in his head. And when he started with this missionary organization, the first thing they did was try to do an exorcism on Patrick. And when that didn't work, they did two more exorcisms on Patrick. And when those didn't work, they sent him to a counselor, to, to reparative therapy, with somebody who didn't have any qualifications to be doing any kind of therapy, who was trying to convince him to be a different person. But these sessions got more and more ridiculous as time went on. And this therapist was trying to, like saying very gross things about what Patrick should be wanting instead of who he was, of like very gross misogynistic sort of dominating things about who Patrick should be in relation to women. And it was on one of those days that something clicked for him and he was like, I'm not the problem. And who I am <laughs> is not the problem in this scenario. This is not, that's not who I want to be. I don't want to meet that standard of expectation. And he said his monster box that he had put himself into broke open. And that's when the real exorcism happened. When he realized that that monster box was, box was just a creative thing. And indeed, it was wide open and he did not belong or fit inside any kind of monster box. And so he spent the next years studying and learning and growing because he'd realized that language had rescued him from this idea. And so he wanted to find ways to use language to help rescue other people. So he started doing these couple day seminars where it would be him and five or six other LGBT people in a room with a bunch of conservative clergy and they would try to rescue folks from this ideology through language, through conversation, through approaching difficult things with, with some grace and some playfulness of language and conversation, and it was very exhausting. And he said one time he got to the end of one of these little conferences, it was the end of a couple of days, and they'd been dealing with all of these difficult, painful ideologies coming at them, the folks in the room who were in the LGBT group. And um, there was one minute left of the session. And the one man that Pat Patrick had kind of hung all of his anxieties on this one man because he was super unreceptive. This one man said, I have a question with one minute left. And Patrick's instinct was to say, you've had all weekend and you're waiting till the last minute. You can email me and your question can wait a little bit longer. But something had happened the night before. And the man had found out that Patrick's partner was the producer of one of the man's very favorite shows. And curiosity overcame whatever else was beguiling him. And he and Patrick had this wonderful in-depth conversation about all of the different things about this show and all of the behind the scenes details. And because of that, Patrick said, okay, what's your question? And the man asked, how many times have my words done harm to you all this weekend? And people were kind and they said, oh, you're, you're a nice guy. You haven't, you haven't done us harm. And he said, don't patronize me. 
how many times have I done harm to you this weekend? And so folks began to list them off. And one person said, I stopped counting on the first night. And Patrick watched as this man listened and he realized that in that moment, the language of the listening and the hearing uh, saved Patrick from putting that man into a box. Letting go of trying to be who we think we're supposed to be, letting go of trying to meet this standard, this norm that's held up, the opposite of what's in the scripture, being authentic. The letting go is in being authentic. Authenticity does not drive us to lie still when we're faced with atrocity and oppression and injustice. It sends us deeply into the darkness of it. And it sends us there, and on the best days, it sends us there with the miracle of hope. There's the apparent disparity in this scripture. Because on the one hand, it's <clears throat> let go of all of the things that we think we're supposed to be. Let go and release the ideas of accept, accept yourself as who you are. Accept what is. Accept the blessing in the world as it is. Accept that viewing ourselves and others as monster and abomination only keeps us from fully living and fully loving. And also resistance. But the acceptance and the resistance of scripture are not pitted against each other. They go directly together, together of living authentically and also standing in this upside down world that Jesus offers, where the meek, the lowly, the poor in spirit, the people who stand up for justice, where that is what we aim to crushing this idea about what we're told about victory and success and happiness for something else. There is a miracle that is always within our grasp, and it is not letting go of working toward wholeness in a battered world. It's, it is letting go of trying to be unbroken people. We will think unkindly. We will say the wrong thing. We will come up short for one another. We, we will get things wrong and we'll use words that harm. But then the question is what we do with that afterwards. Because our voices do matter. In a country that is a democratic nation, joining our voices in the call for a humanitarian ceasefire fire is one small thing that each of us can do. And perhaps it may not come to anything. Perhaps the only thing it will come to is that we used our hearts and our voice to speak from a place of compassion and love and peace in the face of violence, and that is that. So be it, if that is what it is. But it is not a reason for us to not move, to not act, to lie still. And then on the local level, within ourselves, within one another, there is so much that we can do to be gentle and kind, to break open that monster box <laughs> and let ourselves be freed from these ideas and let the people around us be freed from these ideas too. So the man, when he was finished listening to all of the grievances of all of the ways that he had done harm that weekend, he, he said, so every time I come in a room, you have to protect yourself, don't you? And one of the women said, it's not just when you come in the room. It's every time we walk out the door. It's every time we turn on the radio and someone says something disparaging or harmful and hurtful. And the man said, then I have a lot of work to do. We all have a lot of work to do. Holy, sacred, peace-building, blessed work. May it be so. Amen.